I'm really pleased to be here to talk with Ebony G. Patterson about her work, which I've admired for a long time, especially since I saw her exhibition at the Studio Museum in Harlem that looked at the stolen childhoods of black children, especially black boys. Ebony G. Patterson uses what she calls bling, inexpensive faux jewels, pearls, fabric details, and other artifacts in her elaborate tapestries. The colorful textured surfaces force viewers to confront our fascination with shiny objects, even though we know they're there to seduce us. As the media theorist Neil Postman said, just because you know you're being manipulated does not mean you're not being manipulated. Her work makes you think about beauty and seduction, real and imagined. She wants us to look past the bling and heavily adorned surfaces to see the people and bodies embedded in the image, just as she wants us to acknowledge how black people and our bodies are disappeared in societies and cultures. In the gallery, the coffins in invisible presence bling memories are covered with fabric that reminds us of upholstery, wallpaper, and home. Tassels and other details seem to be making the dead person at home in their physical resting place. These heavily adorned boxes are antithetical to the sedate coffins used in most American funeral homes. In some beliefs, the idea of making the deceased soul happy prevents the person from lingering as a disgruntled spirit who might haunt or disturb the living. From that point of view, Jamaican dance hall bling funerals are more than just celebrations of a life on earth, but assurance of proper placement of the spirit in the afterlife. The coffins in the next room celebrate Jamaican dance hall funerals, a more egalitarian version of celebratory funerals that were previously reserved for the prominent and prosperous. Researchers like Vincent Brown have detailed the differences between white Western funeral practices and those descended from West African traditions where most black people came from in the Atlantic slave trade. Instead of solemn occasions driven by grief and sadness, black funeral traditions throughout the African diaspora contain elements of celebration and lightness like this New Orleans jazz funeral. Parallel to the way jazz funerals were appropriated into second line parades, which are performed for no really good reason, but often associated with Mardi Gras. Jamaican dance hall bling funerals brought these elaborate celebrations to everyone. Another aspect of the work in the exhibition, the bandanas used in the 72 project piece, made me think of the Mexican Zapatistas. In 1994, when the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, became law in Mexico, the US and Canada, indigenous Mayans rebelled and wore ski masks and bandanas to make their revolution visible. NAFTA was considered to be terrible for indigenous people, the poor and the working class in North America. Zapatistas are named after the Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata and persist to this day, reaching out internationally to advocate for all oppressed people. Like the people in Ebony G. Patterson's bandana portraits, the masks made the Zapatistas visible in their invisibility. Attempts to silence them and make them disappear are subverted. The Of 72 project confronts the reality that 72 people were killed in one police and military incident in Jamaica, and their names were never formally released. This work, substituting each of the dead with an anonymous person celebrates and commemorates those lives. Visibility and invisibility are recurring themes in Ebony G. Patterson's work, especially represented within lush garden environments. Just as in this detail of a 2015 work in her Perez Museum exhibition, the vestiges of a person are visible among the flora. On the floor, in the installed piece are a pair of shoes that remind us a person was there. The environments of gardens are less apparent in the works in this gallery than they are in earlier and most recent works, but the allusions to gardens through printed and appliqued floral patterns are always prominent.
This piece, Bearing Witness 2017, says see me within another floral composition. This evening we will learn more about what Ebony Patterson wants us to see and why in our conversation. Thank you. Thank you for that very generous <laughs> um, uh, dialogue and examination around the work. Um, so what do I want you to see? I want you to see um, people. Uh, I want you to think and, um, and see the environments that people come, uh, also come, uh, those bodies also come from. Um, I think it's also important for us to think about ourselves in relation to those people um, and uh, to also consider why it's important to acknowledge people, why it's important to make space or to create space for others, um, whether it's in our, um, in our everyday. Right, yeah, okay. So one thing that I was thinking about was um, the images where there's a body among the plants. They're so striking and kind of haunting. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the, your work, a lot of your work deals with death in different kinds of ways. But it made me think about the idea that um, probably not too long ago, encountering a body would not have been that uncommon. No. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, re I was, I think, well, so one, the bodies started popping up in the way that they had in my work after I had to um, deal with a very personal death of mine, which was my father. So the passing of my father, um, I think, shifted the work a lot. And on the day I buried my father, um, I also came across uh, a murder scene in a working class community after um, taking home a number of relatives who had um, traveled with me um, to a rural part of Jamaica um, to bury my dad. Um, and I tried to um, find out as much as I could about the scenarios or about anything that related to this crime scene that I had passed mm -hmm. and who that person may have been. And of course, what happens so many times, because one, it's a working class person, um, there's often very little information, if any at all, about that. Um, about that activity or about that murder. Um, and so I, I found that after, um, after the passing of um, my father and having to deal with this idea or, or the experience of dealing with personal death, mm -hmm. but then also have, having to deal with a public death and then having to share those memories that are both personal and public um, that those two things were pushing up against their, um, each other. And then also, also to the fact that my work was, um, always had this continued interest in um, looking at the way working class people used uh, codes of dress as a, way of uh, as a way of creating space or making space for themselves and dealing with ideas around um, uh, claiming power for themselves, it seemed also to like a kind of logical step to also examine how that happens through the funerary. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the first time I'd ever actually seen a dead body would have been when I was five. Um, and I remember that fairly recently, um, and it was with a family friend. We were parked, I was waiting for my father who had hopped across the street to do something and then we noticed that a crowd started to gather around what we used to, with a, a bus that was called an Encava bus, the brand Encava. Um, and what had happened was a woman was coming off of the bus before the bus stopped and she got pulled under, um, under the bus. Um, and so this family friend hoisted me up on his shoulder so I could see what was, um, what was happening. Of course, my father was incredibly upset um, when he found out that this is what we went to go and examine. Like, why would you do that? 
why you didn't I follow that? <laughs> um, and, um, you know, like, it, it's just recently, like, I was thinking, like, when was the first time I'd ever actually seen, um, you know, seen a dead body, but seen a dead body that had died violently, right? right? So that was really early on. And then I also have a, re even though I never, um, uh, there was a family member of my, my, my mother's um, brother, he was the eldest boy of the, um, he was the eldest boy, second child of nine. Although I'd never seen him at his funeral, um, the way he died was also violent. Um, he died between two buses. He was crossing between two buses and one bus, um, it seemed, ran back. And that he, he died between the, two, um, between the buses. And he didn't have any identification on him. Um, however, my mother knew it was him because of the way his clothing was described. Um, so he was wearing brown shoes, brown socks, brown pants, and a brown shirt with a brown belt. He was known as being a very dapper dresser. And so it, as soon as she heard that, she knew it was her brother. And sure enough, um, it was, unfortunately, it was him. Wow. Um, you can see that that came from some really powerful experiences yeah. and memories. So one other one thing I want to ask you about in, in terms of that is um, one theme that's integral and runs through most of your work is that juxtaposition mm -hmm. of the of life and death, life as represented by living plants and flowers, dead plants and flowers being alluded to. And um, you know, a, aside from the obvious dichotomy and juxtaposition what else do you want to people to understand from that what do you want us to think about when we look at those two things together well I'm interested in 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 the possibility of people thinking about how beauty becomes uh, how beauty could be used as a tool um, and how beauty could become, um, and, and how beauty is used as a tool of power um, by working class people. So for example, um, there's always this critique about poor people or working class people being overly invested in the material things. So the idea of spending lots of money on a name brand, um, garment or accessory but not being able to find the money to um to to tend to the fundamentals like books for school or the school fees or food why is it important um or why is there this engagement with the material or with materiality um on and off the body and what does that do um and so i'm i'm I'm, I'm trying to butt up that kind of conversation um, against um, uh, how people use those tools as a way of like living through hardships right. um, and creating a space um, that doesn't wait for their value to be dictated, but rather to dictate their value. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I may not be able to afford uh, the real Fendi, but I'll get the knockoff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in that flash moment, just in that moment of seeing it surface, I've convinced you that I have this thing. And then by extension, you see me because I have this thing, right? right. right? Um, and so it creates this moment of illumination where you have to take notice of me. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, through the work, uh, I find um, those kinds of engagements really interesting and I'm hoping that when viewers then experience those conflicts or those kinds of butt-ups against um, against the work that when um, when they have to experience then somebody in their in their day-to-day -day, that all of a sudden that person no longer becomes invisible like that person too becomes visible that somehow the work has maybe on the off chance um, forced you to carve space Interesting, yeah. Um, I like that description of the uh, the expensive objects and what that represents. So, I was thinking that um, 
in a way, it seems as if your work gives people permission to indulge and revel in objects that are obviously inexpensive and fake relative to the goods that they emulate, you know, like fake jewels, but they have their own beauty and aesthetics. In your work, even though they are, quote, fake in, you know, in the aesthetics of of commerce, right. they become valuable in this context. So what I'm wondering is, is the idea that people don't need real jewels and gold to have opulence and a kind of wealth that you can make it out of? I I don't know if I wanna, I, would, I wouldn't say that I'm giving people permission to do anything. Sure. I'm not yeah. acknowledging the way people are, right. are doing mm -hmm. it for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, a lot of that, of course, happens because we live in a society that attributes importance to materials. So, like, you have these things, so it must mean that you have value. Um, I, I, so, for example, I've always thought it was interesting that within a um, within our cultural context, so much of, say, for example, in this case in the U.S., it's cultural identity in terms of it, it, it's a it's a huge exporter of popular culture, right? And where um, that culture kind of grows or comes from is, oft is from uh, predominantly people of color. Um, but then when we think about uh, in the day-to-day -day or in, in the larger social structure, um, those people sit at the bottom of the social hierarchy. They're the least valued, um, they're the least valued. So then what does it mean for the people who give so much visibility in terms of a national sense in a global way for those people then to be discredited in terms of their value simply because of what they look like? And then how that then plays out um, in terms of socio um, social structures and, and economic structures, right? right? Um, and so I'm... Uh, through the work, it's not that, again, it's not that I'm saying that this is a, you know, like we should, um, that I'm allowing people um, to be indulgent, but rather to ask people, why do people need to indulge? Like, why is it that the value of a person has to be triggered by the performance of, like, having things, mm -hmm. you know? Um, why am I not enough? Mm -hmm. um, why does uh, my value have to be assigned to things that I have? And where does that come from? Right. I and I think that until we begin to um, you know, challenge or ask questions about those kinds of social structures, then nothing will really shift. You know, and what does it mean then to question and challenge? It's not enough to just like show up and scream. It's also like, what do we do in our day to day, in our in our engagements? Um, how do we shift that in our, you know, on an individual level so that it begins to happen on a communal level, and then it, you know, it kind of spreads. Right. Right. Okay. Um, or grows. Or so, whatever. Yeah. I'm sorry. Or grows. Maybe spread isn't the right word, but grows. Right. Have you, um, uh, so what would be an example of that? Like, what would you say to the people here about what they can do <laughs> in their day-to-day -day lives to shift uh, the perception that maintains these hierarchies? Where do you start to do that? I think listening is really important. You know, I think that sometimes it's really easy to be, you know, like it's really easy to dismiss something because like, oh, you know, like, well, I haven't experienced that. Well, just because you haven't experienced that doesn't mean that my experience isn't, val isn't valuable or valid. Um, nor does it make your experience not valid or valuable. Um, it just means that I have a different perspective. I think that it's also, it's also really important to also understand that um, none of us are monolithic. 
And if none of us are monolithic, then it's important. The only way, uh, the only way to truly acknowledge that is to give pause. I think one of the greatest things in, um, or one of the biggest, um, biggest challenges um, that we all have to consider individually is like, what is our power, and how do we share that power? And I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a, I, you know, like, I don't, I, well. I think it's an I and an us thing, you know? Like, so we have to ask ourselves, like, how am I participating in this? Mm -hmm. um, and even as people who may look like the very same people, right? How, are, how am I also participating in that? How am I making space for, um, for other people in that? How am I acknowledging um, others that sit outside of my spectrum, whatever that may be? Have you, this is, um, I think, somewhat related to that tangentially, so, uh, um, the people who, who, of the 72, the, the people who were murdered in the incident um, by the police and the military, have you, have you ever known personally or introduced their relatives to your work? No. No, okay. Um, I, so first of all, when I made that work, it was between 2011 and 2010. Um, and in 2000, I think it was five years after the incident. So 2015, there was a public inquiry um, that had happened and very little had come out of that inquiry over the, and even over the course of the five years in relation um, to those people. Um, I made the work because I felt like it was important to mark the moment. Um, I felt like it was important to, in, in some ways, I often see my, while my work seems to have an underpinning that relates to activism, I would never consider myself an activist or an artivist, which is another fashionable word. I consider myself a person who is, um, in, in many ways, almost like a history painter, you know? Like, what does it mean to make something so that in 20, 30 years from now, when I'm, I'm no longer here and there are these seeds left, what does it, what does it, what, what does it say about the moment that I was making in? Um, and also, too, how could I not make something. It's, it, was, it would have been so easy not to. Right. Um, at the time when the incursion had happened also too, I was home. Um, it was also the, the summer, um, the same summer when my father had fallen ill. When the incident had happened, it was also the same year my dad had died, he died at the um, end of the year. But I'm, I always remember the phone calls that would play out on um, local talk shows, people calling in desperately asking for the prime minister to intervene. Um, and largely the people who were always calling in, they were always women. Yeah. Um, when we'd see images of um, people protesting in the streets over the, over the, the incident that had, happened, that had happened, which were not very many people, um, they were also women. Um, and it's always interesting, and that to me is, has, um, is, is also really interesting. So the idea that men die, women cry, the fact that we come, we enter this world through the bodies of um, women and then somehow the, the pain and all of that is held in the body of a woman and released again. Um, but there was an activist who had been working really closely with members of the community, um, who Lloyd D. Aguilar, um, who was actively trying to get um, compensation for these, uh, for members of the community who I would, you know, like follow on, um, on Facebook because he had an active page just posting um, things and every, you know, every now and again I would talk to him about what was going on and I followed the inquiry um, very closely and that was also something that was really interesting to, um, to watch how it, would, how it was unfolding. But you know, there were lots of, I got the sense that the community and commu you know, like uh, because the community has been exploited so much, 
you know, in the sense that, um, you know, like everybody was interested in the story, so everybody would come there for the story. Mm -hmm. But not, and, and what does it mean then to come and stand in front of a camera repeatedly and relive the scenario that had happened to you? Because, you know, like the people who passed were victims, but so were they. You know, because they were, they also have another kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have not another kind of trauma. They have their own trauma that they, right. um, they had to deal with, and and were lucky enough to be able to, um, to share these, um, to share these stories, um, with us. Right. And um, yeah, it just felt, it felt like it was really important for me to like, just make something. Right. One of the things I noticed when I was looking at all the panels is that each of the people, if their ears are exposed, it's as if they have earrings. Uh -huh. There's some piece of ornament right. on their ears. And to me, that just seemed like such a caring detail. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me about that. Well, at the, I think that work also came at a time when I was like, shifting gears between um, like this earlier body of work that it was examining ideas around masculinity and um, kind of raising questions about what masculinity m meant and how that was being performed um, through, a, through a dance hall or popular cultural lens. Right. Um, and so some of those um, uh, some of those ideas, I think, just carried forward. And I think also, too, another thing, the fact that the number, the number that kept coming out in the local press about um, the number of people who had passed, um, it's believed, the number is actually believed to be twice the amount. Wow. Um, but this was just a number that kept coming out in the, um, in the first um, days of the incident and carried through until I think the inquiry, there were questions being raised about the numbers altogether that it was believed it could have been more than 150 people because wow. there was an unmarked on, un grave um, uh, of bodies that were never counted. Wow. Um, so I was, you know, so I was thinking, well, if, I'm, if, if it was 72 men and one woman, how do we then de determine um, what that looks like? Yeah. Um, and then also too, there was a story about, that was also circulating about men dressing up as women who had come into the community to fight to defend, um, to defend coke. So I thought these narratives about how gender also became in, um, you know, flexible in these moments and how that was also butting up against, um, you know, questions around stereotypes, around what, what not just masculinity, but um, stereotypes in terms of the kinds of people that also existed in these, um, existed in these communities. It's also part of the reason why I've used the bandana um, around the edges of the of the works. So when I think about the bandana, I'm I'm taken back to westerns and you know yeah. the cowboy um, um, cowboy memorabilia. You know right. the bad boy. Uh, but the idea also too that the bad boy um, on 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 some levels is also seen as like beautiful. You know, yeah. um, if we think about like the character Pretty Boy Floyd, the idea that the word pretty is again associated with this hyper masculine um, persona. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to, um, to butt all of those things up. And then also too, to think again in relation, although you know, the, the work with the coffins came, um, the, the coffins came much later. Yeah. Um, but I, I was very aware of the practice around bling funerals, which was still growing um, at the time and, and only practiced uh, primarily in working class communities, how beauty also became a way of like carving space out for people as they marched through public, um, public space, taking you know, the bodies of their loved ones off to um, wherever the final resting place was. So when they have these um, funerals, what, what is the process of making the coffin? How does that happen? 
So typically what happens, they'll, they'll go to a funeral home and there are lots of funeral, like say for example, there are lots of, um, lots of these working class communities that are in downtown Kingston. Um, in, uh, in the kind of commercial section of downtown Kingston, there are lots of funeral homes. Right. Um, and it says also too a lot about the expectations um, or the, the, the I get, not the expectations, but yeah, well, yeah, um, the expectations and also to the social conditions or the volatility of those communities too. So there are funeral homes that are quite popular um, that are in and around these neighborhoods and there are funeral homes that are, that have managed to, um, you know, create a name for, for themselves in terms of the kinds of funerals that they make, right? Um, a lot of these communities also too, they have um, dons, uh, which are considered informal um, political figures um, that uh, do great things for the community and not so great things. Um, I'll, I'll put it that way, you can read between all the, all the lines. Um, but these dons also, too, when they get buried, um, they would have these like really lavish um, funerals that look a lot like a state funeral. Um, and it makes, you know, like if you think about like in terms of that kind of so hi social hierarchy within the community, the dawn is always at the top, right? Uh, but to think that Miss Mary Jane, who's just like an ordinary person living in the community with no connection to what's happening at the top um, in her community is also having a similar funeral. Right, right. Um, and that she also recognizes her own um, value and that that value um, is performed um, on her behalf by her loved ones, by the members of the community, so much so that it looks like a, a funeral that may have um, happened for somebody who was like the prime minister or some, you know, some major government official. What does it mean then to use all of those trappings um, and to create or to mark a moment of presence, even in death, by somebody who would have been deemed invisible just because of their social rank, um, um, socioeconomically. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, some people actually plan their funerals. There was one interview that I had read um, by, I think it was Annie Paul, where she had interviewed, um, she'd spoken to this woman who every day she would go to a funeral home that was in her community or nearby her community and she was paying down on a coffin that she wanted, <laughs> right? So here it is, she's taken absolute control over the way her exit happens. She's not leaving it up to any, you know, to anyone else, which is also really beautiful. And then people, when they come to these funerals, you know, they'll dress up um, like they're going to a party. So there's no real difference in terms of the attire that may look like somebody going to a club versus somebody who's first going to a church and then going to the graveyard. Um, and it's all considered in relation to the deceased. Like I'm getting this garment to honor this person. Um, and the proximity of these people um, to the person who has died may vary. Maybe somebody who they knew the person really well or you know, was um, a loved one of somebody who they knew, so they're turning up to support somebody who was in close proximity to, the, to that person or just because it was a person from the community. But no matter what, they're turning up and turning up. I see. So c can you explain the relationship between um, dance hall and this kind of bling funeral? We had a conversation about that. Right. But. I mean, you know, dance hall is, it's just Jamaican popular culture. I mean, I think the closest um, immediate, um, you know, immediate thing I would connect it to is hip hop. Mm -hmm. So hip hop has its own, um, it's both you know, like it's both music and it's culture. Right. Um, and dance hall is very much um, the same. So, you know, there's lingo, there is fashion, there are dances, um, 
uh, dances, as in movement, not to be confused with dances which we call parties um, that may happen in particular um, particular spaces. Um, so yeah, I think that's the easiest way to round it up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is that those th those two things? Um, you know, they kind of look similar, um, but they come. Uh, they're they're gro It's grounded in a in a particular kind of cultural, um, it has a specific cultural grounding mm -hmm. and geographical yeah. grounding. So you had um, talked about and you've uh, before and you talked here about uh, the ways that people want to appear like the idea of masculinity, etc. And we had talked about this idea of luminosity uh -huh. that people want to, uh, there are ways that people become luminous. Can you talk about that and how how do you use that in your work? I think, um, okay, so when I think luminosity, I think shine. Um, I just realized I keep looking up at the ceiling, I'm sorry, I should be looking at you. <laughs> but yeah, when I think luminosity, I think shine um, and I think bling. Um, but what about I, what about luminosity? That sort of comes from within, like that it, that something is almost lit from inside. Side, yeah. That somehow gets performed mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. through. Mm, okay. Well, I <laughs> okay. All right. I haven't had that one yet. Okay. Well, I think that luminosity. You know, like that luminosity that you're talking about is recognized first by the individual mm -hmm. who, uh, who recognizes also too that the way that they're being engaged right. um, or being seen um, uh, is affected by wherever they may sit. Um, and while they recognize their value mm -hmm. um, internally, they understand that they also exist in a space, or they live in a com they live in um, they live in a a world that determines that your value is is not something that happens internally, um, unfortunately, but it happens externally. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's why there's kind of like this obsession on the surface, right? Um, that's why there's so much attention or concern about like dress. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think there's so much concern about how dress isn't something that necessarily happens on the body, but is of the body. So, um, you know, like the practice, for example, of skin lightening is an act of illumination. Mm -hmm. um, as evasive, as grotesque, and as problematic as that is, uh, it is that the act of er erasure does create a moment of illuminosity, right? In the sense that if we live in a space that determine, has determined that beauty beauty is on the upper end of the scale. Mm -hmm. So the closer you are in shade to whiteness is the more beautiful, or whiteness or lightness is the more beautiful you are, you are perceived, which is a kind of Eurocentric idea about beauty. Mm -hmm. Then what does it mean then for me understanding that, being on the lower spectrum of that and recognizing that because of the shade of my skin, I no longer have, I, I will not have the kind of agency that I desire. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean then for me to actually erase myself into presence? Right. So here I am, you see me, and you don't just see me because of what's on the body, you also see me because of what I've done of my body. Right, yeah, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, so many, so many things to think about. Well, let's switch gears here a little bit and let's talk about the physical work itself. Um, and w w you were telling me how you make the, uh, you collage and make your own fabrics. Um, uh, kinda. I know, yeah. Right? 
I've done a lot of time in fabric shops, yeah. looking at things, collecting things. Um, and lots of times when I travel somewhere, I try and um, I try to go to wherever there may be like um, fabrics or trimmings that I often take back to the studio mm -hmm. um, and then get used at some point. Sometimes it's immediately, sometimes it's many years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times uh, in terms of like uh, how that all comes together really comes through, you know, like I was trained as a painter. Mm -hmm. So I think about all of these materials in relation to painting, right. um, in relation to, you know, like color, thinking about color, contrast, texture, mm -hmm. um, the push and pull of things. Um, and I think it's like over time, understanding, um, uh, like having this kind of material on the understanding that I'm still trying to find ways to complicate um, that I continue to like push the material, not mm -hmm. just inside, but also outside of the sure. work. Yeah, yeah. So the, there's a huge amount of labor that goes into making these. And what does that, um, it, what does that have to do with Mm, how you're how you're thinking about it. I mean, it seems like the labor is an essential part of it. Mm. Uh, so, can you talk a little bit about what that means to you as the artist in terms of making the work? I mean, I am. I love to work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a little too much, <laughs> um, and I've I've paid physically for it um, already. Um, but there is, so, so one, it comes from, from that place. Like I'm really, um, I'm enjoying the possibilities of discovery in the studio mm -hmm. and all of the new things that I continue to learn from the same materials that I keep um, working with. But then at the same time, I think that it also comes from a place of, I hate to be chintzy, but love. Um, I think that there has to be, a, you know, as I'm, I'm dealing with things or thinking about ideas that could go, you know, just lighter shift. Mm -hmm. um, it could be unsettling and problematic. Right. So I have to think about where I am in relation to that thing or to these subjects um, and how can I make it in a way that communicates the very concerns that I have, that I think comes from a place of empathy. And so I think that then requires a lot of time. Right. And time not just meaning I'm sitting and thinking, but making mm -hmm. and digging from that. Um, and sometimes making so much that, um, that I, figure out the mistakes in that, discard that, and figure out the right thing. Um, so how are you seeing your work evolving? Do you see things, you, you talked about how you um, might find a new material and yeah. figure out how to work with that. Yeah. Do, you ever just, do, do you ever look at your work and say, oh, I see where I started doing this. Yeah. And you know, like, yeah. how does that happen? I go back to things all the time. Um, so from, I, I remember some years ago, like having a conversation with somebody, they were saying like, oh, you know, like your series always seem to be so short. And I always say, well, you know, like for me, it's never done because it's not like, I, I've never finished like a series of work. I always see it as a place that I can always go back to because I'm still unpacking that language. I'm still um, finding ways to turn it, to turn those problems on its head. Um, and, and for me, the work is, is an evolution of that. Uh, for me, it's, this, it's the same problem that I just keep spinning um, slowly around and trying to figure out new ways that I could resolve um, that I could resolve these ideas. So I would never, for example, I don't even talk about um, the two, 2007 work with those, uh, with the figures that were 
oh, you know, it was all about skin bleaching and thinking about like dance hall. I like given the evolution of the work, there's no way I talk about that work in the in the same way. So I'm also forced to re-examine those earlier ideas and to look at how current ideas have managed to stretch that language. Um, because that's the other thing also too as an as an artist is that while your material language is growing, your personal language is also growing. And sometimes those things grow at the same rate and sometimes they don't. Um, I remember you know, like not so long ago in an interview saying, I feel like at the time when I had started this work, I was doing those things, but I just didn't have the maturity of language to articulate it at that point. You know, I was still figuring it out. Um, and to be able to go back to that and reassess that and still feel like I can still pull on those earlier things um, continues to be really useful yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. So when I start, I always go back to where I like last stopped. Mm -hmm. You know, what was the problem then and did I resolve it? Mm -hmm. And how can we resolve it in the next one? Mm -hmm. So how do you figure out scale? Like these, the bandana pieces are small, but they're, they're mounted as a group and take up a space. And then some of your work is just monumental. Yeah. yeah. I, I blame that on my teachers in undergrad, <laughs> to be quite honest. I had a professor, um, Stanford Watson, who taught me in second year painting um, back home in Jamaica, who would always say to me, make three of everything, you know? Um, and it's been something that has continued. Now I'm not making three anymore, I'm making 73. Um, and then I also did, in my undergraduate years also too, I also did installation, which totally opened up, um, opened up the possibilities for what that meant in terms of negotiating our work. Um, but the, I've always made big things. Um, ever since my undergraduate years. So like my final year show in undergrad, I think the, sm um, the smallest painting I had was like a six footer, but the largest ones were like 10 feet by like nine and a half feet. Um, but the scale of these works um, are always considered in relation to the ideas. I don't make big things just because I can. Um, I don't necessarily believe that bigger is always better, but the question, I have to figure out, well, what's the problem I'm trying to solve and what are the best ways um, to execute that problem? Um, so if it needs to be 15 feet, does it make sense for it to be 15 feet if what I'm trying to do is create a moment of intimacy? Right. Um, and then what does big mean? Can big happen through multiplicity um, in the case of the Off 72 project or the coffins or uh, does it have to happen in a, a singular work like um, some like the 2015 um, uh, Dead Trees work that you had shown earlier? Um, with the shoes at the at the bottom, so a lot of those decisions on, in terms of scale are just motivated by the ideas or the needs of the work. So you just mentioned the shoes, and uh -huh. I, I one of the pieces, uh, the description said that um, there there were handmade shoes. Do you have shoes made, or do you use? shoes that you find that are handmade? Okay, so earlier in the practice, whenever you would, my practice, whenever you'd see shoes, those shoes were, um, those shoes were bought. And um, at the time I used to use the shoes that the models would wear and then I would embellish those and create a shrine at the base. But the shoes uh, from that particular series, they were actually made. Um, so for a long time, I really wanted to work with a cobbler, um, and that's such a, you know, like that's not a very uh, popular tradition um, anymore. Um, and especially, you know, like uh, on an intimate scale as opposed to like mass production, you know what I mean? Um, so I was really fortunate in around 2015, um, a family member of mine introduced me to a gentleman um, back home who was working as a cobbler. Um, and we've been working on and off on a couple of things um, ever since. So, you know, I buy my fabrics and then I go, Shoei, you know, <laughs> it goes by the name Shoei. Um, 
you know, um, and I, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I was thinking about this and I think this would work really well. Um, and that's one of the, the, one of the things that I love about being able to, to work with other people who have skill sets that I need. Um, but I'm not, and I'm not able to do myself or not even, or maybe not able to do as well, um, that I'm also learning from them. But then at the same time, you know, they're also learning from me. So we're like, I'm like bringing fabrics and he's like, no man, I don't think that's a man thing. You know, like it's always interesting to also, you know, like to, to be able to challenge his own, um, expectations about what is possible as much as he challenges me on those expectations. Um, yeah, 